I guess, okay. that means, I guess that means we're safe to proceed, I think. When the, when the music interjects, we're good. Uh, hi, everybody. Jordan Hyman here. Uh, I'm the president of the board for the Delhi Collegiate Alumni Interest Group. Uh, and I just wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, I'm sure some others are going to be streaming in, but uh, we're, we're thrilled to be doing this uh, again uh, virtually for the second straight year. One of these years, we'll, we'll probably pull it back together in person, uh, but really elated to have a, a super talented of uh, fellow former Collegianites, if that's the word. Um, the, uh, I, I'm particularly pleased about being able to do an event like this uh, on behalf of the alumni interest group for the Collegian, uh, in part because our mission is all about obviously supporting the Collegian and representing the Collegian uh, and its current staff uh, and everyone who used to work for the Collegian and obviously bringing, bringing all of us together. And this event very much represents the spirit of that. So um, thank you again for everyone who, uh, who has joined and thanks very much in advance to our panelists. I'm gonna hand off to Megan Swift, who uh, was recently, what, April, I guess, right? Officially named the, the, the latest, the newest editor-in-chief of the Collegian. She's going to moderate tonight and introduce our panelists. Uh, so Megan, I'll hand to you. Thank you, Jordan. I'm happy to be here. Thank you everyone else for being here. Um, like he said, we have four great panelists tonight. I'm going to introduce them, um, but feel free throughout the next um, hour to use the chat to send me questions, um, anything you're curious about, and we can hopefully get to them before this is over. Um, so first, I'm going to start with Kurt. Um, Kurt Harler worked on the Daily Collegian in the tumultuous period from late 1968 until December 1971 when he graduated. He held several positions on TDC, including reporter, senior reporter, features editor, and conducted candidate school. A charter member of the Daily Collegian AIG and multi-term member of the board, he contributed several chapters to the AIG's landmark project, the Collegian Chronicles. Can everyone mute, please? I don't know what's going on there. Sorry, give me a second. I'm just going to make sure everyone's muted so we can hear. Can you mute that person? Yeah, I'm trying. Sorry. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, thanks for bearing with me there. Um, great. Uh, for the second half of bio, for the past 22 years, Kurt has worked as a freelancer writing magazine articles on physical and data networking security, agriculture, sports turf, and environmental issues. A former executive editor with such magazine publishers as Harcourt, Brace, Jovanovich, Edgar Communications, and Advent Star, he holds a BA in journalism from Penn State, a BS in agriculture from Penn State, and an MS in agricultural economics and rural sociology from Ohio State University. Kurt is an avid mountaineer, caver, cross-country skier, and USTA tennis player. Um, on to Dan Donovan, who is a 1971 Penn State graduate. He was a sports writer at the Daily Collegian, rising to sports editor by 1970 to 71. He covered track, soccer, wrestling, and football. Dan was on the School of Journalism Student Advisory Board and was awarded a 1971 Outstanding Senior Award for Extracurricular Activities. Dan worked for the Pittsburgh Press for 20, 21 years until it was closed. He was a sports writer and sports columnist for 13 years covering hockey, baseball, college sports, and the 1984 Olympics. He covered Penn State football for the press in 1982, including the 1983 Sugar Bowl win that gave Penn State its first recognized national championship. Dan covered general news and wrote features for eight years. After the sale of the newspaper, Dan worked for CNG, a Fortune 500 energy company, in its corporate communications department. He started in employee communications and media relations, earned an MBA, and eventually took over communications with Wall Street, including writing the annual report and presentations for the CEO and CFO. A merger with Dominion Energy created a Fortune 200 energy company, and Dan became a director of communications, responsible for the communications of the natural gas companies. His wife, Sandra Fischione Donovan, is a 1972 Penn State graduate. He has three children and four grandchildren. Two of his children, Elena Maurer and Neil Donovan, are Penn State graduates. And Terry, born in Pittsburgh, grew up in Fairless Hills, a suburb of Philly, drafted in 1966 during freshman year at Penn State. 
served one year as a reluctant artillery soldier in Vietnam War um, from 1967 to 1968. He then returned to Penn State in 1968 at the Abington Branch Campus and then reached man main campus in June 1970 and worked for the Daily Collegian in its sports department. He was an assistant sports editor to Dan Donovan, then sports editor, for a year. Out in the real world, he served as a small town newspaper sports editor in State College and then Doylestown, PA, for 10 years before moving on to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, for the final 30 years of his newspaper career. He retired in 2012 and has since published, self-published five books on the Vietnam War and edited three oral history books, one on newspapers and two on growing up in Lower Bucks County. He lives with his girlfriend, Cheryl, and their German Shepherd Storm in Rhode Island. And last but not least, Teresa Villa Cook was a member of the Collegian staff from 1970 to 74 as a reporter and copy editor. On the Collegian, she learned journalism skills and made connections that helped her get three newspaper jobs. After graduation, she worked briefly as a reporter for the Hanover Sun, but then went on to a career as a copy editor, which she really loved. She worked on the copy desks of the Roanoke Times, the Baltimore Sun, and the New York Daily Record. After a newsroom layoff forced her to retire in 2013, she worked for a neighborhood magazine and took on some freelance writing and editing. Teresa and her husband live in Baltimore and have three sons. They volunteer with organizations in the city and enjoy spoiling their three granddaughters and two cats. So welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. And Dan has a little something to kick us off. Yeah, I thought uh, it deserved to put a little bit of perspective on what happened during our times uh, at Penn State. Um, this is supposed to be the celebration of the grad uh, 50th anniversary of the classes from 70 to 72, 71, and 72 didn't have a 50th uh, because of the pandemic. But things were different there. Um, and I'm going to begin with a, a curse. The curse is called May You Live in Interesting Times. It's an uh, ironic curse because interesting times are full of change, conflict, and uncertainty. Uninteresting times are peaceful and calm. The years the classes of 1970-72 spent at Penn State, roughly from 1966 through 1917, 1972, were interesting, perhaps the most interesting in the history of the university. They were full of change, from change in presidents and football coach and the freedom and voice the administration gave to students. Penn State was far from the most radical campus in the nation. Many of us just went to classes and parties and football games and made lifelong friends and observed the demonstrations from afar. But Penn State had lots of controversial issues and protests, marches and demonstrations, followed by large, bold headlines in the Daily Collegian. The good change, and perhaps the one we re most remember, was the beginning of the paternal era. His first year as head coach was when the class of 1970 were freshmen in 1966. Our years at Penn State were full of bowl game victories and two consecutive undefeated seasons. There was controversy there as the President of the United States chose Texas as the national champion for political reasons. Paterno bought his uh, football players national championship rings anyway. It was called the Grand Experiment, where Paterno turned out players who were also good students, led by Mike Reed, perhaps the best football player I ever saw at Penn State. He was a concert pianist, songwriter, has written uh, musicals, uh, and played Big Jewel, the college musical, uh, Guys and Dolls, while he was there. In 1969, Paterno turned down the Pittsburgh Steelers coaching offer. Reportedly, he was offered $70,000 a year, which he thought would make him rich compared to his $20,000 a year salary at Penn State. Money was a lot different back then. We were at Penn State during very divisive times. I think even more divisive than today, although it was more of a generational thing. Uh, our, our saying was don't trust anybody over 30. During our time at Penn State, the civil rights movement echoed and affected Penn State with sit-ins and demonstrations for more opportunities for the few blacks on campus. While we were at Penn State, Martin Luther King and Bob Kennedy were assassinated and an attempted assassination put George Wallace in a wheelchair. The women's liberation began and Penn State students burned some bras and argued they should get some social freedoms as, uh, as many as male students had. We got our draft num numbers on December 1st, 1969, which changed the lives and futures of nearly all the male students. 
There were war protests and sit-ins and old main steps were regularly occupied. The administration called the state police then to sit in and at Old Main and a peaceful protest turned ugly. 18 state police were injured and 29 students were arrested. And Kurt was a, a witness to that. After the shooting at Jackson State and Kent State, the 1970 spring term was cut short. The students given the option to either take their grade as it was or take the course pass fail with credit. Only a few courses scheduled finals. The environmental movement began, and Kurt Harrow would tell you that he covered the first Earth Day held at Penn State. Sadly, there was a murder on campus. Betty Arzma was found in the stacks of Petit Library on November 28th, 1969, over the Thanksgiving weekend. The murder remains unsolved. The Daily Collegian was in the middle of all this, with its news stories, columns, and editories, editorials, often blistering the administration for its policies toward Blacks, women and demonstrations, blacks, blacks, women, demonstrators and students in general. As the paper moved more towards the students and away from the administration, we were moved to a second basement office. The administration started its own newspaper to more openly communicate with students. Eventually it died from lack of readership. Though we made lifelong friends, added meaningful class, attended meaningful classes, and saw education through the context of what was happening outside of, outside of University Park. It wasn't called Happy Valley back then. Um, for those of the collegial, we got wor real world experience covering controversial and explosive issues. Stories we wrote were read. We, we did live an interesting time at Penn State, but in many ways, it wasn't a curse. It prepared us for what we would encounter when we left University Park for the real world. Thank you so much for setting the scene, Dan. Um, and that sort of leads me into my first question um, for you all. What was it like back in the day working at the Collegian? What was your you know, job like day to day? And, and what building did you work in? And anyone can feel free to chime in. We can just rotate around. Oh, uh, we worked well, we at, yeah, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> we worked at by ter by temporary we had better conditions, but we were in the basement of Sackett, which looked like a basement. That's what it looked like, um, and it was kind of bare walls, uh, no windows. Um, you got to go down this dirty stairway down and get down into it. Uh, we had a great photography studio, we had great photographers. Um, the people were outstanding uh, people. We had um, very high quality people work for us. Um, most of them went into journalism. Some of them went even better things, but anyway, um, and, uh, uh, the, and uh, you might mention the photography was all on film. There was no digital oh, photography no, then. It was all it was, dark rooms. And, right. No, the dark room stuff where they had to, you had to develop your own pictures <laughs> with the whole thing and in the dark room. And I know I took a course in it and uh, it was hard. Our photographer, Noah Roach had his hair in a ponytail and uh, Joe Paterno did not like that at all. Those were the times. <laughs> but uh, my first, my years, it was uh, hot type down uh, at the Center Daily Times, which was, we went through an alley down uh, ac across uh, College Avenue uh, and through the alley into the back. And that's where the um, Center Daily Times had its print shop. They printed the paper for us. And we, of course, had to go and babysit it at night. The editors uh, took uh, turns. Uh, you know, there was, a, in my case, sports editor and an assistant sports editor. And we went every other night um, down there to make sure, uh, you know, proofread it and everything before it went on the presses. It was that hot metal type, upside down, backwards you'd read it when they were working on it. Um, it, today, the Calder Way is what you would know it at. It got gentrified from Calder Alley, which is really what it was and probably still is. It's, yeah. It's, what was the bar next door that we went to after the paper was done? The Scorpion or the brewery? Mm -hmm. I went, We went to Shandy Gaff, I thought. That was, down. that was further down. There was one right near this old CDT building. Scorpion, I think it was. I don't think I was old enough to drink. True, true. You were a kid. <laughs> so what I'm curious. Sorry. 
Go what ahead. Is Teresa, remember, what I'm um, I'm curious about Teresa's memories. Well, I I feel very fortunate that my freshman year, which would be spring of '71, fall of '70, and spring of '71, I went down to that uh, print shop with hot type, um, and I was there the very last day that the collegian was printed with hot type. Uh, the mm -hmm. following year, we went to what's called cold type, and we moved to Carnegie Building. So I, I kind of feel lucky that I was in on the very end of the hot type era, and <laughs> then we modernized. Wow, that's that's actually kind of crazy. Um, it, is. it is. Yeah, and I guess like sort of going off the fact that you had the dark room for photos, what was it like? you know, getting in contact with sources, how was that? And, you know, were you able to make any sort of phone calls long distance? How did that work if you needed a source that might have been farther away? We had an 800 number, which was free calls uh, anywhere in the country. Um, I think we'd all agree that our most precious possession was the phone book. It wasn't a dictionary. It wasn't anything <laughs> other than a phone book that had the campus and Harrisburg contacts. The nice thing about that uh, 800 line was that you could use it to call friends when reporters weren't using it. And the, the women that I knew at the time all thought I was rich because I could make calls all over the state and places and chat them up for a half hour. Uh, and that was in the days of expensive long distance calls. You all probably remember when you arrived on campus calling home person to person and saying, is Kurt there? And of course, your father or mother would say, no, he's not. And you go, okay, I'll call later. And that way they knew you had gotten back to school safe and sound. It was a little different error even for the telephone company. The only phones were at the end of the hallway of the dorms, or we had one in our apartment downtown, downtown but you didn't have a phone. Phones weren't something you used all the time to communicate with anybody. You went to see them. Wow, I can't believe that. We now we pick up our cell phone and we can get in contact with anyone across the across the United States within minutes. Um, so that's also crazy to hear about. Um, I'm curious. I know we've always had a, a hard time getting information out of the university. So what was the collegians relationship like with Penn State administration back in the day? Conflicted. Um... Teresa, you can probably talk to this as well as I can, but it was always an adventure going up to Old Main. And, and yeah. one of the advantages of the person to person is you did develop sources who would respect your reporting or what you were doing. But right. by and large, it was difficult, especially during the demonstrations and, and some of the conflict. <laughs> Teresa, how did you handle that? Well, I, I wasn't in, I didn't get there until 1970. There weren't any demonstrations that I, and I didn't cover them. Um, a lot of the war protests were over when I got to campus. So you'll have to speak to that. But there were issues uh, with the uh, administration that really the paper hammered in on. Um, early 66, they, uh, the size of Penn State had like tripled in the 10 years. And they uh, built per first Pollock and then East East wasn't quite finished on time. So there wasn't enough, uh, there wasn't enough room for uh, all, those, all the freshmen they admitted. There, there wasn't enough housing. So uh, students protested, they built a, a, camp, a tent out in front of Gull Walker Town was on the, that used to be the president's uh, house. He was the last president to uh, live on campus in the house uh, over by the obelisk. And uh, they called it Walker Town, the president's Eric Walker. And he didn't know how to handle protests. And then they had another protest. Um, the only place you could buy books were the downtown bookstores. I think there were only two, two. And uh, students said, hey, the prices are too high. Can't we have an on-campus uh, bookstore that takes a reasonable you know, reasonable prices don't gouge just like the downtown bookstores do. Uh, there was the, that protest. The uh, women uh, early in my uh, college career had to sign out for everything out of the dorms. They couldn't just go out. 
somebody came with them. They had a sign with sign them out, everything like that, except to go to class. They could go to class without sign. But uh, there was one um, protest about it. They uh, uh, hundreds of women all signed out for the New College Diner, which is a twenty seat uh, diner on, on College Avenue at the time. So that was kind of a protest. Eventually, the regulations uh, eased. I mean, I think when I was there, it was still pretty tight that you had to, uh, women had to sign out. They couldn't just go out. Uh, of course, so they had the little you never sat, you never, a guy never sat foot in a woman's dorm, dorm either. You could not. They had the little men downstairs in all of the women's residence halls. And um, one of the, the real concerns, a lot of the, the uh, women that I, I knew was your roommate or somebody could go down there and go, oh, look who Teresa went out with last night, because you had to literally sign in and sign out with those people. That only lasted about two terms. Uh, I do remember um, 1968, my freshman year, most people wore jackets and ties to uh, football games and, and other events, not necessarily to class, but to football games were a dress up. A, a woman had a skirt on. She, she looked sophomore year that kind of went away. By junior year, we were lucky that the people on the stands were wearing clothes. So it, it was a <laughs> little bit of a migration that way. <laughs> Wasn't that college diner the one that originally had the grilled stickies like they really grilled them for you it was something yeah. you could order on the menu yeah yeah definitely i think that the box should say waiting to be grilled or to be grilled stickies they're not really <laughs> grilled yet you know we talk about all of the, the different protests whether it was the black student union whether it was the anti-vietnam whether it was the women's rights uh uh a relatively small percentage of students actually participated in any or all of those. Uh, it was it was interesting uh, and a little depressing to see the number of students that would come out for a particular demonstration. Uh, and obviously, it appealed to different groups uh, depending on what was being uh, talked about on on Old Main Lawn. Uh, the Hint Center, as Dan mentioned, is now uh, or then was the president's house and. Mm -hmm. um, Eric Walker kind of ran away to uh, South Atherton, a nice home uh, uh, just beyond where Myers Dairy is now. It was the, the president's residence that, that it got moved to. And um, I can remember spending many uh, afternoon with the protesters in the either the, the uh, main lobby of the president's home or in Old Main. My, my favorite perch was on the steps out front. Uh, mm -hmm. To, to this, you look at Old Main to the left, there's a, the steps go up and there's a platform. And if you look at the old FBI files, my picture is uh, always pretty much right there to the side of the doors. And um, th there was a lot going on. Uh, and, and there was some conflict too with the, uh, you mentioned the ponytail with the photographer and Chopin not liking that. Um, the uh, football players would show up at some of these uh, demonstrations. And I remember, uh, if you think back to the, the graduate as a movie, they got very tense a number of times and people would stand up and say, you know, out of Vietnam or screw the president or whatever. And somebody got up and said, I just want to say one thing. And somebody in the crowd yelled plastics. And if you remember <laughs> the line from the graduate, it just broke up everybody, whether they were for or against <laughs> the demonstration. Uh, right now, you're looking at some of the pictures uh, from the stories uh, that were done uh, in April of 70. And uh, unfortunately, there was construction going on across the street from Old Main. And a lot of students used that construction material um, as, as weapons. Um, and the, the demonstrations did to a degree get out of hand. And, and 29 students eventually were uh, taken to Rockview Prison and, and processed. Uh, a lot more than that were arrested, but uh, the, the state police put them all into a school bus and, you know, they just opened the back door to school bus. You almost had to want to be arrested, not to have escaped. Uh, Tina Hondras, whose byline appears here with mine and often did throughout the, the 70s, that, that era, uh, we, we both covered it. And um, it, it, was, uh, it was a peaceful protest when it started and, and it just got out of hand. And, 
Um, most of the protests were, were much more peaceful than, uh, and they always happen on sunny, bright days. Uh, the only days I got to go to class were on rainy days because the, there weren't a lot of people sitting out on Old Main Lawn then. Um, the uh, Garfield Thomas Water Tunnel, which was known as the Ordnance Research Laboratory, uh, was another site for protests. Uh, and the, there was a lot of student activism in that time, even though it was a, a, probably only a, a tenth of the students on campus were there. There were conservative organizations too. There were conservative, yes. The, the, the uh, Young Americans for Freedom was a very Republican oriented group that, that uh, was, was quite conservative. Um, there was a black uh, student union, which uh, closed down Shields building uh, on two separate occasions. Uh, I remember Tina, who was a, a rather small woman and I both being escorted, if you will, by some black students out of the building. They, they, didn't, want, they didn't want coverage of what they were doing, although they wanted everybody to know what they were doing. They, they, were, uh, uh, they hadn't really generated a, a good uh, publicity. They could have used some of your PR uh, uh, knowledge, Dan, uh, later on or earlier on. I um, want to chime in with another question here, sort of go off of the little pieces, little snippets we've heard of, you know, what it was like to be a woman at Penn State um, and how women's rights were, you know, coming to the forefront. So wanted to ask Teresa what it was like, um, you know, being a woman at Penn State at the time, but also what it was like to be a woman working at the Collegian at the time. What were some barriers you might have faced, um, how you might have overcome those, uh, anything like that? Well, um, first of all, it was harder for me to get into Penn State because there were 2.5 men admitted for every woman. So I like to think that I'm smarter than a lot of the guys. We, we women. We knew, we knew you were. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, and on the collegiate, actually, I recall it being very close to 50-50. I think the sports department was mostly men, but I think in the news department, we were pretty much half and half. And my first couple of years, I think most of the leadership was male, but that changed. And there were uh, women became editors in 73, 74, 75. So um, there was, I had no problem being a woman on the collegian. That's for sure. Um, let's see what else I can tell you about that. I do want to say though that things kept changing for women on campus. By the time I got there in 1970, there was no signing in or signing out. It was 24 hour visitation in men's and women's dorms. There was no dress code. Um, and things kept loosening up after that. A couple of years later, there were women admitted to the blue band and they kept admitting women to more things that they'd been excluded from. So things kept opening up. I did not major in a traditionally male field. And I imagine women who did may have had problems or issues with that, um, but not at the Collegian. Well, that's great to hear. It definitely has carried to today too. Um, I'm really curious because I know our print has changed a lot um, ever since you guys were there and, you know, we print once a week now, but I'm so curious what it was like to print every day, how that worked with your schedules. What was the work-life balance, if there was one at all? Um, I know we feel like we're overwhelmed a lot with just one paper a week, so I can't imagine. It was five days a week, and we didn't do yeah. Monday or Tuesday, or Sunday or Monday. Sunday, Monday. It didn't work. It was Sunday, Monday, yeah. So football games were sort of funny because by Wednesday, you're writing a feature for the next game before you really get uh, you know, you get, you get the last game over with, you know, it was uh, very different. Uh, it was long hours on those nights. Um, uh, because there was they, no work balance with the collegian and class. <laughs> that's right. You, you went to the collegian, you did your reporting, you did your stories, um, and, and uh, you watched your grade point average uh, uh, drop quicker than the stock market. I'll tell you that. Was, yeah. yeah. People said they majored in collegiate a lot. Of That's right. I did. Yeah. Although but it was we good. just had one deadline a night. We didn't have to tweet 
right. and yeah. post all day long. Right. We had one deadline a night, so. 11 was, o'clock. Yep. That was it. Harry, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I'm like them. Uh, I mostly just went to the collegiate office every day and uh, school was an afterthought. Uh, I would go sit in the classes, but uh, I got my education from working at the collegiate and putting a paper out every night. And some of my professors were helpful at times, but the collegiate is where I got my education. Yeah, for sure. Um, gonna jump over to some questions in the chat. Does anyone remember what tuition was like back then? We had a few questions about that. Three hundred and fifty dollars so, a term, and you went three terms. Um, and room and board was about the same amount, if I recall. Wow. I think I remember but, how much different money was back then, too. It was, and eventually it continued to increase. And I know one of the things you talked about the collegiate and, and the the university and how we were at loggerheads. Uh, we certainly were not in favor of tuition increases. And uh, Joyce's uh, article here is, is a good example of, of uh, um, so twelve hundred dollars for a year, and this would have been in seventy two, and that was three terms. So. Um, yeah, we had the Dan, Dan, how much did you get paid as a sports editor? I think it was like 116 a week or something like that. And then that what the, a lot. the collegiate? No, that was your first job. That was yeah. Oh, when I graduated, yes. probably like seventy two hundred dollars or something like that. No, like, I'm what? I'm talking about at the collegiate. How much what do you remember? You, you remember less. Thirty-five bucks a week, I thought. Yeah, that's, that's, right. Probably, that's probably right. 45, maybe I got. That sounds about right. Yep. Yes. That's a lot of money today. That would be like 200 bucks a week. We could get in big trouble with. Wow. A week. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. I mean, we just get our grant checks now. We don't do the weekly anymore. So it's really interesting. Yeah. I remember about $30 a week as a reporter. And, you know, yeah. slices of pizza were a quarter and you could mm -hmm. really go downtown and spent about eight bucks all night. Oh yeah, that was a good salary. Wow. Yeah. I remember the little green checks would show up in our pigeon holes and mm -hmm. we say, oh, I'm solving again. There, there were checks, there was no direct deposit back then. <laughs> and uh, and they cost you a quarter or 50 cents if you took your check to McClanahan's to cash it. So I went downtown to one of the banks and opened an account for $5 and I had free checking cashing. And, that account never had more than about eight dollars in it, but they cashed my check, so it paid <laughs> off. Wow. Uh, speaking of spending money, I'm curious. Outside of the collegian, what were some of the pastimes that you know people would do after hours, after classes, on the weekends, um, and where were like the main hangout spots? Well, there was the very collegian offices. That's <laughs> where we all hung out. I was a downtowner. I lived a bunch of guys in an apartment and you know there were parties every now and then uh that sort of thing um at, talking about the women thing it was very hard on us too you know two and a half to one uh, it, sometimes it felt like it was 10 to one especially freshman year so that was that was a hard part of Penn State um but there were you know there the first we had 54 fraternities so there were a lot of fraternity parties for, for that group um the uh, apartment people, they were, they were just really starting. All those Beaver Avenue ones came a little bit later, but they're starting to have different apartment buildings and, uh, and, and uh, people are living downtown. Um, but uh, there were, you know, when, one thing I remember a lot, what a lot of people did was intramurals, other guys. There was intramural everything, uh, baseball, soccer, volleyball, everything. There was a lot of sports. They didn't have a lot of murals. You go out there. Yeah, well, that I was, was the master of the cheap date, I think. I would, uh, the, the sports things you're talking about, you could go to a Penn State wrestling match or volleyball, whatever game and, uh, other than football, just for showing your student ID. The other thing that was very popular was each of the residence hall areas had movie nights. And for a quarter a person, you could go down and see 
a whole night of, of Clint Eastwood, uh, uh, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly and hang them high and, and all those good old films. Uh, uh, and the last thing was at the music building, you mentioned Mike Reed. I, I heard his senior recital, but all of the music uh, art students had to do a recital as part of their, their senior program. And so you could really impress a woman about how much class and culture you had by taking her to hear somebody play Mozart on the piano uh, who was six foot five and weighed 280 pounds. So it was, it was fun. <laughs> what were you trying to make sure he, they weren't more attractive than you were? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Wow. Um, so jumping up to Maisie's question in the chat, um, did you feel like when you're covering um, events, anything for the Collegian, like, did you feel like you could accomplish um, what you set out to do with that story or were there barriers? It took a long time. But one of the things that, that uh, always gets me as I wander around campus today is the buses. And we, we had a major editorial campaign to close down the roads past Old Main and the hub and the roads, basically all the roads and campus is what we wanted. But um, that eventually came to pass and the buses came to pass, but it was a decade after we all had graduated before there was uh, bus service, uh, you know, the campus loops and the loops out to the, the various <laughs> apartment complexes and so forth. Uh, there were many things that the Collegian campaigned for that didn't happen. We weren't there when they occurred, but many years later, uh, as the administration kind of saw the wisdom that our 20 year old minds had come up with uh, and, and followed along and, uh, and implemented and, and uh, that was one of them. Wow. Um, so I'm curious to know what each of your favorite stories were that you worked on, either stories or if you want to share a favorite memory instead, if you can't remember a specific story, but I want to hear each of you sort of chime in on that. It's funny because probably people will say that the uh, Orange Bowl probably be my best, but um, I uh, really enjoyed uh, covering the international gymnastics meets they had there. Um, uh, they had uh, different uh, gymnasts from other countries would come uh, because Gene Whetstone was uh, a national figure, international figure in gymnastics. And first, the first couple were, um, were uh, men only um, gymnastics uh, and they had uh, people from Sweden and Finland, I think were the two. But then they started having the uh, Japanese women came and the most remarkable one was the, uh, a Russian team came uh, I believe it was my senior year. And Russians at that time were somebody, something you never saw. They were not, you never saw what a Russian looked like. You heard about them. Um, it, it isn't like today where they're playing hockey or anything like that. And it was, you know, the Cold War was just beginning the edge and they're just trying to get relationships with uh, Eastern uh, things. And they actually had a Russian, um, a Russian uh, team and men and women. I actually, Dance with a Russian gymnast at a fraternity party uh, at Penn State. I still have a headache from that party, Dan. Where there was a lot more going on than dancing. And <laughs> you don't want to get into a drinking battle with a little short five foot one Russian woman because she's going <laughs> to kick your butt. Well, actually, my favorite story memory is uh, the first time I met Joe Paterno because after Dan stop being sports editor, I got a phone call from the sports information director saying Joe wanted to uh, talk to me. And um, this was like being called into uh, the FBI building or something. So we had had an article in a paper that Joe didn't like. And so he called me into his football office with all the tricks and he threw the collegian down on his desk and said, you know what I did when I read this, this story and I said, no, Joe, what? And he said, well, I got to ask you, aren't you proud to be a Penn Stater? And it, it actually hit me at that moment that Joe thought we were supposed to be supportive of the Penn State teams no matter what. And so for the next 10 years that I um, dealt with Joe, it was always surprising to me that he just didn't really realize that even the Penn State alums had to cover the team objectively. And uh, so that was my favorite memory. 
All right. Mine is how my very first reporting story and how I learned to be a reporter, which is what the Collegian was great for teaching us journalism skills. And mm -hmm. I was, as a little freshman, I was assigned to cover the student government meeting, the USG. And Kurt came with me because he was the older experienced guy who was going to show me how to do it. And we sit there and listen through the whole meeting and I'm taking notes and we leave and we're walking from the hub to the basement of the Sackett building. And Kurt turns to me and says, okay, what's your leave? And I was just flabbergasted because I hadn't thought, oh yeah, that's right. I'm going to go back to the newspaper office and I have to type this story right away because it's going to be in tomorrow morning's paper. <laughs> and that, that was just a really good lesson right there on how to cover a meeting and be prepared to write about it right away. And I, I uh, acquired that skill. And then I was able to pass that on to future students also. Good. But it was, it was good. It was good. It was a great learning experience. Thanks, Teresa. Glad I was good for something anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed covering all the various demonstrations and so forth. And one of the things we did, this was way before anybody had email and, and so forth, is we would call the Associated Press Office in Pittsburgh, and you dictated your story to a uh, generally a woman there, a desk editor. Uh, and there was a woman named Donna who beat the living daylights out of me as a reporter and made me a good, a good. Uh, writer made me think well as I wrote but you had to dictate word by word and, uh, God forbid you forget to say capital P capital S for Penn State uh, as you dictated them so there was no fax machines you couldn't just send the story to them uh, and, and that, that was quite a learning experience as well uh, it was uh, uh, a great thing and we had all kinds there's a bomb scare uh, series every time there was exam week it seemed like we had bomb scares because they would close down the uh, uh the school for a day or a half a day and um all the fire alarms would go off and uh never to my knowledge were any of them uh true threats i i truly believe even today that most of those bomb scares were simply uh, a student's uh trying to avoid taking his midterm to you know, exam in biochem or education or whatever it happened to be. Wow. Um, <laughs> that's so crazy. Just hearing how different it was back then. And, um, you know, it's really interesting. So I guess for, you know, people my age, how did the collegian help dictate your careers in journalism and what did you learn from working at the collegian that helped you in your everyday life moving forward well, i didn't become a professional journalist i became an economist but i uh, spent time working with uh, under rod nordland uh who i think most of you know who who he is yeah. when i was there winner. yes and uh, he uh started um, a, a column called Logbook, um, which uh, was focused on reporting off-campus off crime. And he showed me how he would go down to the uh, police department every day and go through the logbook and very carefully record all the details about the crimes that had been committed. And not once was there ever any question about the accuracy of what was reported in Logbook, as far as I know. So I think that was a very, very helpful to me in my career as an economist, learning how to pay careful attention to details, and reporting them accurately. I, I will say that one of the interesting things we mentioned, my covering the first Earth Day, uh, which has since become a major event. Uh, two of the four of us were not journalism majors. Teresa, you were a Spanish major, if I recall. Right. And I was an ag major. And the reason I got to cover Earth Day is, oh, yeah, it's Earth Day. Give it to the ag guy. He'll know what's going on. Um, <laughs> Where the dirt okay. is. Yeah. Well, I, you know, look at my fingernails, even today. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the experience, though, of, of covering a whole variety. I mean, I covered Isaac Asimov when he came in. 
We had Muhammad Ali, who at that point had been suspended and stripped of his heavyweight title, who did the colloquy talks. And um, Charles Schultz, the guy who drew peanuts, which came around. And it was fascinating the people to interview. And, and one of the ones I feel bad about to this day, it wasn't all successes. Um, I interviewed Mr. Rogers, um, who was on the Pittsburgh uh, uh, public race, as we all know. But at the time, I thought he was just a local guy with a local show on the Pittsburgh station. I honestly did not realize his national reach. Um, didn't hurt much, I don't think, on, on the eventual story. But I, I thought he was just a local like Philadelphia Sally Star or uh, you know the other uh, personalities who were on TV. And it's like 10 years later, I realized, oh, my gosh, this guy is. Well, that was when my kids started to watch that. Uh, Mr. Rogers neighborhood. And um, I still like the sign uh, as you come across the turnpike from Ohio into, into Pennsylvania, which says, welcome to Mr. Rogers neighborhood uh, in Pittsburgh. It's, he was a good man. Very patient with a very naive reporter too. Well, when Penn State started going national, there were more big city newspaper uh, writers covering the game, almost every game they came up. And um, Paterno had this weird thing about he said that the game ended, he took the players halfway across campus. So that's where the interviews were. And the press box was, stayed where it was. So they had to write their stories. It's, so uh, basically we were runners. We would, we would go to the uh, inter player interviews and uh, uh, collect quotes and bring them back to the you know, city, city guys. And you saw how the stories were put together. You saw how it, how it wound up in the paper. Um, of course, we had to get our own, but of course, our deadline was so far away. But anyway, um, we learned a lot about how big city newspapers worked and got contacts. And uh, I know I got a job uh, as a summer intern at the Pittsburgh Press, and they let me do everything. I mean, I wrote stories about Steelers. I covered Steeler training camp for a week. That was after a one in 13 year which nobody cared about the Steelers back then. There were people who were calling them the same old, same old Steelers that year, but still, you know, let me do that, did a sidebar in a Steeler game. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, it was good. Uh, it led to a job. Uh, uh, we really got good training. We did. Yes. Yeah. It's surprising that there was very little professional. We, we were, quite a competition with the New York Times, the Center Daily Times, the Pennsylvania Mirror, um, uh, the Harrisburg Patriot. Uh, you know, when you, as you said, Dan, when you covered sports, you were covering it against uh, the Post-Gazette, the Inquirer, the Bowling Philly, yeah, the York Sandy Dispatch. Pe yeah, Andy I mean, and Phil Music. And news was the same way. Uh, uh, someone posted, uh, I think, Stack in here that about the uh, meeting her husband uh, on the, uh, the Pew Street garage. Uh, the collegian I was very proud that we were the first ones that broke the story that uh, uh, State College was going to go away from just parking metered lots and go to a high rise parking garage. And um, I actually got that lead from a journalism teacher uh, at Penn State who uh, said, hey, you know, you really should look into this because uh, I guess his son must have been one of the architects who had been approached about it. It was kind of a backdoor thing. And um, he was kind of happy, I think, to see the collegian beat the CBT on that one too. But it, it was very competitive and the uh, university was not all that happy to, uh, to support us in a lot of ways. So, uh, what, our circulation back then was about 10,500 was the press run. Um, and, you know, given the number of students on campus, which was probably pushing 15,000, we had pretty, uh, pretty good reach, um, across campus. I mean, uh, some of you might've taken a geology course from Larry Lapman. His GSI 20 was really popular. He also did, uh, for majors, but his one rule is you could not read the collegian in his classes. You could do almost anything else, but, uh, you couldn't open a copy of the Collegian in his class. Larry was a good teacher. <laughs> his Schwab thing was 500 
students is geology. Class. Right, Schwab Auditorium. Yeah, right. and, we, and we've been entertainment. If it would uh, today, would be highly rated on television. It was yes. really entertaining. Talking about rocks, we all had our little boxes of rocks. Somebody remember when he ate the chalk? rock and mineral kit there. He would eat a piece of chalk. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that was. I remember that. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Can um, I make a comment? Can sure. I make a comment here to the group? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted. To, all right. Uh, I graduated in uh, as an in, an engineering student, but I wanted you I want you folks to know that we're working at the Collegian at the time. You guys were my source of information. I I looked at that Collegian every day, for Great. you know news, sports, whatever. To me, you were my link to the outside world, and I really appreciate what you guys have been listening to what you guys had to say here tonight and, and, uh, uh, the job that you did at the time as students, is pretty remarkable, quite honestly. So uh, thank you. there's our thank best you guys read for, article. Uh, the, pardon me. There's our best read article, our best read page in the collegiate every time it was the final exam schedule. And, uh, that was the place yeah. we found oh. out when and where you were taking your tests. Absolutely. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the young people understood what the term system was. The idea was to have four terms a year. Yes. A summer would be a whole term. And then we had a, a fall term that was, we started later than everybody else. And we were done right after Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And then we had a big Christmas break. But then we had to cram two more uh, terms into uh, the, the first six uh, months of the year. So we had uh, a winter term and then a spring term. And we didn't get out till, I think we graduated about June 9, 18th or 19th uh, yes. of June. And uh, my friends that went to Pitt, they were out in April. So they got all the good jobs, that's for sure. <laughs> Some of the jobs. Wow. Do you know when they went away from that? That's really interesting. I don't think my daughter had it. Yeah, I think it was late 80s. Jordan, were you on terms or uh, semesters? We were, we were semesters. Okay, so it was probably we were late. Still, we were still terms in the early 80s. <laughs> okay. When I graduated. Yeah. One of the things to get back to, to what the Collegian covered, we did a really good job of covering the local news and not getting sidetracked so much by big national events. We actually had a column that had little shorts, uh, kind of precursor to what USA Today does, but where we did little two or three sentence or paragraph length things on national news. But uh, I think we all realized that our, our main charge was to provide Penn State students coverage of Penn State events. Um, mm -hmm. And things of interest, you know, it might have been Harrisburg, but it was the, you know, the lack of support from state government, which, by the way, Megan, you could do a story on this afternoon, I'm sure, and it wouldn't read that much differently than what Teresa or I or any of us did back in 1971, which is very sad. Uh, Pennsylvania has been very lax in supporting uh, its higher education. I think we generally come in third or fourth to the bottom behind just states like Wyoming and New Hampshire that don't have the population, but for a state as big as Pennsylvania. Um, and now I'm writing editorials again. I'll, I'll leave that to y'all. You do a great job with it. <laughs> um, does anyone else have anything to add before I ask one final question? No? Okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, what is one piece of parting advice you would give um, anyone here? Um, also students my age, just anything you've learned over the years that you'd like to share? Well, I think um, probably the, current, the best example of that, don't just do one thing when you go to college. Don't just go to class, find something else to do. I mean, if it's intramurals or the band or collegiate or a fraternity or something, don't just go to class and, uh, uh, I, I think that's the best thing when, when you go to college. It's your it's a time of your life where you're finally independent from your family. You can pursue your own interests, you can pursue your own friends, 
and and don't just get stuck in your economics book or your engineering book. Just get out and, and, and find something else to do. I would yep. totally agree with that. I, I often give students a quick talk that compares university life to like an Amish all you can eat buffet. And if you go into the buffet and all you eat is the mashed potatoes, now that's your fault. You know, you should have a little bit of the salad, a little bit of the beef, a little bit of the vegetables, a little bit of the pie, experience the, the whole thing. Um, but I think most of the people listening here are probably well past that stage. Um, and I, you know, I get asked a lot, what should I read? You know, you've got fake news and real news and CNN and, and Fox and the whole bit. And, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to read and expose ourselves to a lot of different news sources. Um, read uh, or listen or however you happen to get it to all different sides of the story. The United States is kind of sad in only having one daily newspaper in most cities. If you, if you go to, to London, there's a labor paper, there's a conservative paper, there's a liberal paper, there's a communist paper. Uh, you can read all these different papers and, and get, get an idea of what really is going on or at least have a little more balanced view of what you, your opinion of what's going on rather than taking it from one source and believing that it comes with an imprimatur and, and it's uh, gospel truth. <clears throat> Uh, it requires you not to be lazy, uh, which is the difficult part. Everybody wants to be spoon fed answers. Uh, uh, you know, you Google something and all you find out is the answer to what's the capital of Azerbaijan. But how did Azerbaijan get to be there and why is that the capital you don't get? And I think it's even with things like the Trump hearings this week. Uh, um, you know, you've got to look at several different sources to get an idea of what's really uh, going on and, and the old saw that you have to get both sides of the story is false. There are 36 sides to every story, 52 sides to every story. Uh, and it's a lazy citizen in the United States that only gets one or maybe two sources uh, for their information. Well, and that's for the, my reporter's lecture. Well, for the fellow journalists on this call and for the young journalists coming up on this call, Come here. I would say, please subscribe. Yeah. Pay for, your, pay for some news. A quick look at this guy right here. We would appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. That's hysterical. Um, Terry, right. anything to add? Yeah. Oh, me? Uh, no, I was just listening to everybody, and uh, I was thinking that. I'm the only one who really stayed in newspapers until I was 65 years old. Uh, I don't think Teresa lasted that long, but Dan certainly got out early. I loved it. I love newspapers. And um, my advice to the kids of today would be to find something you love and, and do it and have fun doing it. Great. Now, I never worked a day in my life. It was... Uh, I mean, there were some stressful days and some deadline days, but it, it was always interesting. And uh, whatever you covered, there's no dull stories, only dull reporters. Well, I think that pretty much wraps us up. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, all the perspectives you offered and for being here today. And Thank you everyone else for being here today too. Look at that. We got a minute early here, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was awesome listening to you, talking with you all. Um, thanks for coming out. Thank we you. We are. And safe. We are. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.